ஐ போவன் வணக்கம் ஆம் வயோனி டிமெல் திஸ் இஸ் பாஸ்டன் லங்க நியூஸ் பிரிங்கிங் யூ நியூஸ் வியூஸ் அண்ட் என்டர்டெயின்மெண்ட் ஃப்ரம் பாஸ்டன் அண்ட் யூஎஸ்ஏ முஸ்லிம் ஃபேக்டர் இன் த கலம்பு முனிசிபல் கவுன்சில் இலெக்ஷன்ஸ் டாக்டர் இம்தியாஸ் எக்ஸ்பிளைன்ஸ் Sri Lanka has come a long way according to the IMF credibly address the allegations US urges Sri Lanka the world lost a great actor Joa Baby Krama passed away the elections for 23 local government bodies including 17 municipal councils will be held on October 8 in Sri Lanka The Colombo Municipal Council elections will be closely watched by political observers as the UNP struggles to maintain their voter base in Colombo. According to the election secretariat, the ballot paper printed for the Colombo Municipal Council was 2 feet long. To understand the importance the Muslim voters play in the Colombo Municipal Council elections, we spoke to Dr. A. R. M. Imtiaz. Dr. Imtiaz teaches political science at the Temple University in Pennsylvania. Dr. Imtiaz, the Muslim community has become a major voting bloc in the Karamba Municipal Council elections. All political parties are trying to win Muslim votes. Any thoughts? Muslims in Karamba are uh, they contain 25% of population. If you know the if you know the Karamba district population, the Tamils are um 35 singles are 42 and muslims are 25% so the 25% of muslims uh, major major of them live in a colombo uh, colombo municipal council area if you look at the area specifically there is one of the one of the poorest areas you would find in colombo district there are 21 schools uh, within that colombo municipal council area and most of them are in a poor condition in terms of management the quality teachers and also you see uh, if you look at, if you see the uh, government in institution in kalamba district uh, every uh, you would not get a uh, principal position for muslims in kalamba district even though they are 25% but you would not get even 34% of muslims official in kalamba district so when i was in kalambo you know then i would i didn't get any single uh, SI a uh, uh, police officer in Kalam in Green Park that is uh, quite common in m- most of the part of the Colombo district but that's one fact uh, the muslims of colombo you know many people think that, that they are they are wealthy guys you know they are doing trade thing you know so that kind of myth is there about muslims also the muslims in colombo often time favor either SLF or UN especially for UNP you know the from 1948 till last the last election muslims have voted you know significantly for the UNP the reason is that they muslim kalambo think that the UNP is pro business so they would think that you know they would they, their their interest would be safeguarded by by voting for the UNP so this election next month you know might pose some significant challenge for the UNP because you uh, you might know the uh, Milna Maragoda is contesting under the uh, ruling alliance so he might pose some challenges major muslim in kalambo is still think that uh, UNP is the best party for them also another fact you know the UNP has a green color flag okay so muslims have a kind of interest or appetite toward green color you know the islam is associated with the green color so some muslims for them my family when i was young i still remember those words my mom would tell me imtiaz i vote for the unp because that's a, they have a, a flag of deen deen mean in arabic uh, uh in, in arabic uh, you have you are you are religion So some Muslims in Colombo think that UNP flag which is a green is a flag of Muslims a uh, flag of Islam. So it's a kind of common for the Muslims in Colombo especially to vote for the UNP but this election might pose a 
big challenge for the UNPSF. Uh, Dr. Imtiaz, uh, there were some articles recently about the growing Islamization in Sri Lanka. You have written on that and according to you, uh, this is a trend that has been ignored by moderate and liberal Muslims so far. Is this a dangerous trend? Uh, could you explain what this could lead to if not addressed properly? Uh, all of the demands from the Muslim elites uh, more or less were accepted by the uh, by the political class of Sri Lanka. For example, the whatever Muslim elites demanded were accepted by the by the government, establishing schools for the Muslims, uh, allowing Muslim women to wear farda. And these were accepted without any problem. So these were the these, these developments were uh, occurred before 1983. And after 1983, what happened was, you know, uh, you know, uh, before 1978, um, Sri Lankan government introduced kind of a liberal economic policy, or they opened the door to the world. So Muslims, you know, Muslims who are basically kind of, you know, uh, uh, impoverished people, you know, they thought that they could not find uh, education in Sri Lanka, and they thought that easy way to go to Middle East. So they went to Middle East and they to get a job. When they went to Middle East for the for the job, they also were able to expose to the Islam uh, they have what they call Wahhabism or other form of Islam. These Islams, these form of Islams were very strict. They they were you no know, these were you know, these were these were strict in a sense. You no, know, they did not they did not have a very very open society mindset. They they ask Muslims to behave more Muslim way, to wear farda, to wear cap, you know, to think in a Muslim way, to behave like a Muslim way. These were made possible mainly due to the after nineteen seventy eight, uh, thanks to um, thanks to the uh, economic policies introduced by Jaya Jaya Vardhan. during the war. The LTT expelled the Muslims, LTT killed Muslims, hundreds of Muslims were killed, butchered by LTT uh, in the East. And uh, almost 75,000 or 65,000 Muslims were expelled by LTT in the North within two, within 48 hours. So this, all, the, all these matters contributed for the Muslims to go closer to the Islamic fundamentalism. And now we see in Colombo, for, for example, my own district. My age, grandpa, if you go, you would say many young girls wear hijab, farza, and I'm not saying they are bad, but that was a result of Islamization. And uh, as you might know, you know, now we are in the post September 11 period. The jihadists from Middle Eastern countries or South, other part of Sri Lanka or South Asian other countries, you know, they are serious about Muslim grievances everywhere in the world. When they find that grievances are there among the Muslims in somewhere else, they open their big eyes. So Sri Lanka is Sri Lanka is located very strategically important place. When you win Sri Lanka and you win the global struggle, so the Muslim jihadists know this fact very clearly. So India is one of the great enemies of Islamic jihadism. So, and the, the, the artists know that, you know, if they were able to get some food or some ground in the eastern part of Sri Lanka or southern part of Sri Lanka, that might greatly help them. So, I, I have my own fear about this Islamization. Of course, there are no evidence that, you know, Muslims in Sri Lanka have a, have a, have a close link with uh, Al-Qaeda or whatever. But you cannot totally rule out anything in future. Thank you, Dr. Imtiaz. That was Dr. Imtiaz from Pennsylvania. I think we've seen a big change. We've seen investment beginning to come into Sri Lanka. Mr. Anup Singh, Director of Asia Pacific Department of IMF, responding to a question on Sri Lanka at the press briefing in Washington, D.C., expressed his optimism about the Sri Lankan economic growth. According to Mr. Singh, Sri Lanka has come a long way in the last year and GDP growth is expected this year to be around 7.5%. Inflation has moderated and 
I, I think we've seen a big change. We see investment coming into Sri Lanka. We've had a program supporting their policies. This program continues through May of next year. I think overall a lot has been done. Sri Lanka has introduced new fiscal reforms to broaden the tax base, to remove exemptions, to bring these in line with international standards. And I think we can be quite confident the government and the central bank remain confident to carry forward these reforms. We've just come back from discussions in Colombo just last week, I think, and we're working with the government to address the pressures that are arise as they are recovering from the events of the last so many years. The government of Sri Lanka needs to take steps to credibly address some of the allegations leveled against it during the final stages of the war. U.S. State Department's Deputy Spokesperson Mark Toner said at a press briefing responding to a question raised by a reporter who wanted the latest update from the U.S. after the panel report on Sri Lanka was submitted to the U.N. Human Rights Session by the U.N. Chief last week. Meanwhile, making a submission at the 8th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, human rights activist Nimalka Fernando said that human rights situation in Sri Lanka required further attention. She further said that the government of Sri Lanka was obliged to share the modalities of its investigation into human rights violations. The issues at stake related to accountability and compliance. An interactive dialogue was called for, said Mrs. Fernando. World-renowned Sri Lankan actor Joa Bevikrama passed away last week at the age of 84. He began acting in 1957 and had more than 100 films to his acting credit and he was the only Sri Lankan actor to win an international award for the Best Asian Actor at the 1999 Singapore International Film Festival for Purahanda Kaluwara, Darkness of a Full Moon. Among the noteworthy movies he acted in were Saravita, Valikathara, Ranmuthuduva, Parasatumal, Tungmang Handia, Badegama, Sikuruliya, Aswasuma, Purahanda Kaluwara, and others. Joa Bevikram is regarded as one of the top most character actors ever produced by Sri Lanka. concludes our news edition. We meet you again with another news edition of news, views and entertainment from Boston and USA. Till then, goodbye.